particular redemption, effectual calling, final perseverance, particular redemption, a sermon by the Rev. J. A. Spurgeon of Southampton, I think it is well that the death of Christ and its consequent blessings should occupy one place in our discussion here tonight, for not only is it the central truth in the Calvinistic theory, but the death of Christ is the center point of all history and of all time. The devout of all ages have stood and with anxious glance into these deep mysteries, searching what, or what manner of things the Holy Spirit did by them testify and reveal, and we know that hereafter, in the world of glory, the redeemed shall sing of these things for ever, and shall find in the Redeemer and in his work, fresh matter for love and for praise as eternity shall roll on. We take our stand between the two, and I think the language of our hearts too, night is akin to all ages of the Church of Christ. God forbid that we should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now the grand result of the death of our Lord, though not the only result, the grand result of that death, so far as man is concerned, is the redemption which it ultimately achieves and with regard to the extent of that redemption, we believe the scriptures are plain and speak most clearly, when they tell of a final day of manifestation, when the redeemed from amongst men shall take their stand before the Redeemer, to sing, of him who, as the good shepherd, hath laid down his life for his sheep, and has purchased unto himself a peculiar people, his body, the church. Now, we believe that, in reaching that grand and final result there are many steps that must be taken and we think that, from these preliminary steps, there are multitudes that gain rich handfuls of blessings who shall not however reap the full harvest of glory. We believe that the whole world is flooded with blessings, and that the stream rolls broad and clear from the hill, foot of Calvary, and laves the feet alike of the godly and of the ungodly, the thankful and the thankless, but from the riven side of Christ there comes forth one stream, the river of life whose banks are trodden only by the feet of the multitude of believers, who wash and are clean, who drink and live forevermore. We speak tonight of Christ's death in its various relations, so as to touch upon and include sundry things which cannot be properly classed under the title of particular redemption. But we feel we are driven to this course so as to be able to do justice to ourselves and to our leading theme. Now, we have three sets of truths before us, and these three sets of truths we must deal with. 1. We have, first of all, a God holy and righteous, loving and gracious, a God who has been most grievously wronged and injured, and a God who must be honored alike by the giving him all the glory of which he has been robbed and by the bearing of his just expression of holy indignation at the wrong that has been done unto him. We have a God jealous in the extreme, and yet, strange enough, declaring that he passes by iniquity and forgiveth transgression and sin. We have a God truthful, who has sworn that the soul that sinneth it shall die, and who yet speaks to those souls, and says, Turn ye, turn ye, for why will ye die? A God whom we know must be just and must execute upon the ungodly that which they have justly merited, and who yet, strangely says, Come and let us plead together, and though your sins be as scarlet I will make them as wool, and though they be red like crimson I will make them white as snow that is one set of truths, strange, and apparently contradictory. Then we have another too, we have a world lost, and yet swathed in an atmosphere of mercy. We have a world dark with the darkness of death and yet everywhere we find it more or less under the influences of the beams of the sun of righteousness, which came a light unto darkness, that did not and could not comprehend it. And we have, moreover, a world rebellious, and serving another matter than the right one, and yet nevertheless beneath the feet of him who has been made head over all things for his body's sake, which is the church. 3. And then, once more, we have a church peculiar in its unmerited privileges, chosen from before all time to inherit the kingdom given to it before the world began, a kingdom that can never be trodden upon save by the spotless and the deathless, and yet the inheritors are by nature dead in trespasses and in sins, list, ruined, without a God and without a hope in the world. How are all those strange and apparently contradictory things to be solved? One clue, we find, 
is in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The work involves its ultimate end, which is redemption, and of that work we are about to speak to her too. Night. We speak first of those blessings which come from the death of Christ, and are for all men, the whole world is under a mediatorial government, the whole spirit of which is a government of long, suffering, graciousness, tenderness, and mercy, such as could not have been exercised had Christ never died. A government there might have been, but it must be, we think, a government akin to that which is found in the place where those are found who make their bed in hell. We find, moreover, that the direct and indirect influences of the cross of Christ have pervaded the world, and none can tell how full of its gentle spirit has come like oil upon the troubled waters, or what man, with his wild passions, would have been without the ameliorating influence of the cross. We possibly may be able to tell, when we look across the impassable gulf into a jana beneath, and cease in unchecked working out its dire results and, we believed that whatever comes short of that darkness, whose very light is darkness, is due to that light which radiates from the cross of Christ, and whatever is short of hell streams from Calvary. And then, further still, we have a Bible, a revelation filled with the love and mercy of God to man, a Bible in which our Lord himself could show, beginning at Moses, and in all the prophets, that which did testify concerning himself, and, apart from Jesus Christ and his death, there could have been no such revelation of God's character unto the human race. A revelation there might have been, but it would have been a revelation of Sinai's horrors and terrors, without even the spark of help which comes forth from that dispensation that set forth. There might have been a revelation, I say, but it would have been a revelation that would not have wound up as this does with a blessing. It would have ended like the Old Testament with a curse it would have begun with the same. It would have been worse than Ezekiel's roll of woes, which is filled all over with terrible lamentation, and with awful sorrow and woe. And again, there is a positive overture of mercy, a true and faithful declaration of good tidings unto every creature, and we do believe that it is our duty to preach the gospel unto every creature, and the gospel runs thus, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved for he who believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That overture we hold to be no mockery, but made in good faith, and that overture is not the overture of a shadow, but the presentation of solid, substantial blessings, and for the rejection of that, not God, but man is answerable, and for the rejection of that he will be lost, for this is the condemnation, that they have not believed on him whom God hath sent. And, then, lastly, we find that as the purchase of the death of Christ there is a church and that church is sent forth into the world with orders to bless it and to do good unto all men. It is bidden to go forth as a light in the midst of darkness, it is bidden so to live as to be the salt of the whole earth. Now, we say that each one of these blessings is no small gift from God to man, no mean result of the death of our master, and, combined, we think they would form a bond worthy of a God and, as we put our hand upon it, we think we can give full and true expression, and with an emphasis surpassed by none to that glorious text, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, and we think, upon our system, and upon ours alone, we can give full truthfulness and emphasis to the remainder, that whosoever believeth in him shall have everlasting life. Now, upon redemption proper, the latter part of our theme, we will pass on to speak. And, first, what do we mean by redemption? Most certainly we do not mean the possibility of redemption, for we have learned to distinguish between the possibility of a thing and a thing itself. We feel this, that we do not preach and cannot preach, gathering our teaching from the Bible, a possibility of redemption. We proclaim a redemption. Nor do we mean by redemption a contingency of redemption, which, again, is contingent upon a third thing. We have learned to distinguish between a contingency and a certainty. We proclaim a certain redemption, and we speak of that which is not possible but positive, not contingent but certain. Neither do we mean by redemption such an outgrowth of the man's own poker or goodness as shall enable him to burst his way through every bondage and to get forth free, such an elevation of human nature, whether by the education of others, or by his own works 
as to enable him at last to stand free. If we meant that, we should use the word escape, but not the word redemption. And again, if we meant, as some, alas, have seemed to mean, God's waiving his claim upon man, God's waiving man's liabilities, and God's giving up that which I believe, as a holy God, he cannot surrender. If we meant that, we should speak of emancipation, of pure pardon and forgiveness but we do not, we mean redemption. And then, gain, we do not mean by redemption the meeting of the debts, either in prospective or in the present. We do not mean that the man shall either in the present or in the future, bear any part of the penalty, and, by some goodness, either in the present or foreseen, satisfy God's claim upon him. If we meant that, I think we should use altogether another word than the word redemption. What do we mean by redemption? We mean, by redemption, the work one being which is done for another, but generally a helpless one, in order to give him perfect freedom. And when we speak of redemption, mark you, ere speak of a thing that is the result of that work. We distinguish between redemption and redemption work. What we mean, by redemption, is just this the grand result and end of the work of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we could as well speak of redemption apart from the redeemed, as we could speak of life apart from a living creature. Life and living creatures are so extensive, and so is redemption and the redeemed. If you take down any book that will give you an explanation of the word redemption, I think you will find three things, put therein. It is a ransom, a rescue, and a release. Now, I take the whole three words to be the fullness of the meaning of our one word. It is such a ransom, and such a rescue, as result in a complete and full release. Whatever stops short of that thing, is, of course, not the thing itself, the thing itself that we mean, is the positively being redeemed and made free. Now, just by way of simplifying the subject, let me speak of the Redeemer, and of the redemption work, and of those who are redeemed. First, the Redeemer, who is he? We believe him to be the word that was with God, equal unto God, and was God, who became flesh and dwelt amongst us. At the same time, the flesh did not become, in any sense, deity, neither did the deity, in any sense, become carnal. They formed another person and that person the God, man, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Now, what is he? And here I just ask that question, in order to meet some objections, and, if I can, to put on one side two or three theories that seem to fight against ours. I hear a voice, saying, in reply to that question, what is he? Why he is God's idea of humanity. He is God, who has taken up humanity from its fallen state, raised it up not only to the place where he first put it, but, beyond even to the height to which he hoped it would ascend, or possibly something beyond it. And, now, from henceforth, such is the union betwixt common humanity, that the lost, in their degradation, have but to look to their common humanity exalted, realize their identity with it, and to feel themselves, by that deed, raised to the same standard and redeemed and free forevermore. To which we reply, there is enough of truth in that lie to keep it alive, and that is all. We do believe that our master did lay hold of humanity, we do believe that he is the most perfect man that ever was, we do believe that he has honored and dignified the human race, by taking that upon men, and by becoming flesh-like unto ourselves. But we cannot see how that the gazing upon that can open blind eyes, unstop deaf ears, give life to the dead, and procure a discharge of our sins any more than we can see how that the gazing upon an Olympic game could give to the physically lame, physical strength, or could give to those who were physically dead, life from their physical death. And, again I hear other voices replying to that question. They say, he is the great example of self, denial, and of the submission of the human will to the divine. And what redemption is, is this, that man now can look to that great display of self, denial, can catch of its spirit, and can imitate it, and by the deed of subjection making the will to succumb to the will of the divine, they may, at least, emancipate themselves, and go forth free to which we reply, once more, there is enough of truth in that just to cement the error together, and to give it a plausible appearance to the sons of need, 
but there is nothing more. It is true that our Saviour was the sent one of the Father. It is true. He came, saying, Lo, I come to do thy will. He declares he was not doing his own will, but the will of him that sent him. And he winds up by saying, Not my will, but thine be done. But, after all, we cannot, and dare not accept that submission of Christ's will to the Father, as being a satisfaction for sin, neither can we see, how, by the imitation of that, we can, in any sense, wipe an eye the sins of the past, or free ourselves from the penalty that is yet to come. But now to answer for ourselves, what our Lord Jesus Christ, and we say, that in life he is the great example and copy, in death, he is the substitute, and in both, the federal head the elder brother and kinsman of his church. But now time warns me that I must pass on to the second thought, the work of redemptions first of all, we gaze at that part of the work which is Godward, and that we call atonement, and, when you ask me, what is the character of the atonement, I reply, it has a twofold nature, to correspond with the twofold character of sin. Sin is a transgression of the law, and a consequent insult to him who is the lawmaker. But it is something more than that. The power by which he has transgressed has been perverted, it was given to him to obey the law that he might glorify God, and to make, therefore, satisfaction for sin. There must be a bringing to the law obedience, there must be the bearing of the sanctum because of the disobedience, there must be the rendering to God the glory due to him, and there must be the bearing of his just displeasure and the expression of his holy wrath and indignation. That Christ has done, he came and his whole life was obedience to the law, for he was obedient even unto death and in that death, he bore the sanction of the law, for he was made a curse, it being written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. His whole file was spent to glorify God, and at its close he could say, I have glorified thee and I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do, and his death was the bearing of the just displeasure of God towards the sinner, and in the agony of his heart he cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In these things we behold, therefore the presentation of the obedience due, the giving to God the glory due, the bearing of God's displeasure and the enduring of the curse of the law. And now the question would be put to me as to the value of atonement. We believe that its value depends not so much upon the being appeased, nor upon the beings to be atoned for, as upon the being who makes the atonement. The value of Christ's atonement is the value of himself. He gave himself for us. If he had stood as the surety of but one soul, he could not have been less than himself. If he stood as a surety for the whole world, he could not be more, he gave himself. What more could he bestow? The value of the atonement is the value of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his flesh, he can take man's place, and by his divinity he can give, and must give anyhow, an infinite value try the work that he, in mortal flesh, performs, for one soul. Therefore, it must be infinite, for more or less it cannot be. Infinite it is, and infinite it must be and we have ampart or parcel with those who would say, that if Judas was to have been saved, Judas amount of agony would have had to have been borne by Christ, and Judas amount of penalty would have had to have been paid, in addition to what has been borne and paid by Christ. He took the place, the room, and stead of the church, and then all that he was worth went in that church's place instead. More he could not do, if he had taken the place of the whole world. But, you ask me, is there any limit to the atonement at all? I say I think there is, and the limit seems to be, not in the value, but in the purpose. The limit seems to be this theory, for whom did he die? In whose place and stead did he stand? If he stood in the place and stead of the whole world, then he made atonement for the sins of the whole world, and the whole world will be saved. If he stood in the place and stead of his church, then he made atonement for his church, and the whole church will be saved. We believe that Christ took the place and stead of every believer, that the believer's sin was put on him, and thus the ex, sinner can go forth free. But I hear a voice saying, I challenge substitution, and I object to that. So be it. I ask you, did Christ die for sin at all? It must be answered, 
yes, then for whose sin did he die? If his own, then he suffered righteously, did he die for the sins of the whole world? Then justice cannot demand this again, did he die for part of the sins of the whole world? Then the rest of the sins will still condemn the world, then must have Christ died in vain. We believe that he took all the sins of some men. It was not a fictitious condemnation, it was not a fancy sin made for the occasion, it was a positive sin that had been committed by God's people, and is transferred from them to him who laid down his life for his sheep, loving us, and giving himself for and in the stead or in the place of his people. But, then, we say this work of redemption comprised something more than thus paying down the ransom, and the bearing of the penalty. It is, moreover, a rescue, for sin has not only made men thus to have insulted God and broken God's law, it has transferred them unto bondage under the allegiance of one, the strong man armed. They must be freed from that. Christ came, has destroyed death, and through death him also who has the power of death, even the devil making an open show of them upon his cross, ascending up on high victor, leading captivity captive. And then, I think, there is yet something further. Sin has affected the man himself, made him to need in his own person releasing from the dominion, power, and corruption of sin. This Christ has secured by his covenant with the Father. But that which I take to comprise effectual calling and final perseverance. I shall leave to my brethren who shall speak afterwards. And now as to the persons redeemed, who are they? The church, we say, whether you look at the church as elect from all eternity, or the church believing in time, or the church as glorified hereafter, we look at them all as one, and we say these are the redeemed, these are they for whom redemption has been procured. We cannot add to their number, we cannot diminish them, for we believe that those whom God foreknow, he did predestinate, that those whom he did predestinate, he also called, for whom he calls he justifies, for whom he justifies he also glorifies, the whole are one, and for these redemption has been made. Now, if I may be permitted the time, I will just touch upon one or two objections, and then I will conclude. I hear someone saying, but by that, sir, you surely must limit God's love. I reply, is God loving when he punishes any and doth not save all? Then is he loving also when he purposes to do that, for whatever justifies the deed justifies the purpose which gives the morality to the deed. And then I hear another objections. How can you, sir, upon that theory, go to preach the gospel unto every creature? You have heard that answered, we have got the order, but, I reply yet further, I could not go and preach the gospel upon any other theory for I dare not go on that fool's errand of preaching a redemption that might not redeem, and declaring a salvation that might not save. I could not go and say to a man, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And he would ask me, Do you think you are going to heaven? Yes. Why? Because Christ died for me. But he died for us all, and my chances therefore are as good as yours and he might reply to me after he had accepted my declaration, and after he had believed, and begun to rejoice, after all he might say, is there any real reason why I should rejoice, some for whom Christ died are in hell, and I may also go there, I cannot begin to rejoice in your news till I feel myself in glory, it is rather a faulty piece of good news, because it is nothing positive it is a grand uncertainty you have proclaimed to me. Now, what we preach, is the gospel to every creature, and that we take to be this, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ you shall be saved, if you do not, you will be lost, and lost forever, you are not redeemed, you are not saved, there is not, in another word, salvation and redemption for you, because I cannot say that there is salvation and redemption for those who are lost forever, but we add, we are what we are by divine grace, we have believed, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ you will be as we are, will be able to boast as we do, humbly in the Lord our God, or in other words, if you believe, and are baptized, you will be saved, if you do not believe, you will be lost, and lost forever. Effectual Calling A Sermon by the Reverend James Smith of Cheltenham My Christian Friends 
our minds have been occupied to day with some of the loftiest subjects that can engage the thoughts of man, our attention has been directed to the infinitely wise and true God, and we have been endeavoring to conceive of him as the great, the infinite, the eternal, the great, the infinite, the eternal intellect, who, of himself, conceiveth the grandest schemes, and infallibly provides for their accomplishment, so that there can be no mistake no failure. We know that every wise intellect forms its plan before it provides its means, or attempts to carry out the idea conceived in the mind. And the great doctrine of election, to which our attention was directed this afternoon, answers to the formation of the plan in the infinite mind of God. He foresaw, clearly, that the whole human race, represented by the first man, would fall into sin, and left to themselves would certainly perish. To prevent a catastrophe so fearful, he determined in his infinite mind, to have a people for himself, a people that would comprise the vast majority of the fallen inhabitants of this world's were all present before his mind their names were registered in his hook, which book was delivered into the hands of the Lamb, the Son of God, who accepted the book at the hands of his Father, and, as it were, signed it with his own name, so that it has been designated, the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And Jesus looked upon this act as the committing of the people to himself, on purpose that he might take the charge of them, on purpose that he might carry out the Father's will respecting them, and gain eternal laurels and honors to himself, by placing them in splendor, majesty, and glory before his Father's face forever. We therefore find him frequently when speaking with his Father and referring to this act in the eternal counsels, saying, Thine they were and thou gavest them me. Keep those whom thou hast given me by thine own name, that they may be one as we are. But election interferes not with man as standing in Adam, but with man as under sin, the result of Adam's fall. It ensured their restoration, but it did not interfere with their fall, and consequently the elect, with the rest, all fell in the first man. The entire mass of human nature became depraved, polluted rotten to the hearth's core, so depraved, so polluted, so rotten, that nothing could effect a change but the omnipotent energy of the omnipotent God. There is that in depravity in every form, that defies the touch of anyone but the infinite, that refuses to succumb to anything but to omnipotence itself. The heart of man is foul as the heart of Satan the nature of man is foul as the nature of Satan, and the sin of man is worse than the sin of Satan. Satan, the great archangel, that fell from heaven, did a tremendous deed when he set mind in opposition to deity, but man set not merely mind, but matter with mind in opposition to the eternal God. God could once look upon the world and say, though mind is in rebellion, matter is not in opposition, but after the fall of man, mind and matter alike were corrupt were depraved, were in opposition to the eternal. Every man's heart steams with enmity against God, every man's spirit rises in rebellion against God, and, as you have heard to, night the verdict of every man's conscience in its fallen state is, no God no God, and if the eternal could be voted out of existence by the suffrages of his fallen creatures, every hand would be up, every heart would give its verdict and every voice would vote for the annihilation of the Most High. The will of man strong, the will of man sterns, the will of man determined, and opposed to the will of God, will yield to nothing but that which is superior to itself, it laughs at authority, it turns with disgust from holiness, it refuses to listen to invitation, and, in this state, man, the universal man, is found. In this state, man, the entire mass of man, with the exception of those who had been saved on credit, and had been changed by the sacred influences of the Spirit, in this state man was found when Christ came into our world. He came and, as ye have heard, assumed humanity, and united it with deity. The two natures constituted the one person of the glorious mediator, that glorious mediator stood the representative of his people, that mediator stood the surety of his family, that mediator stood the substitute of the multitude of his fallen ones. That mediator came to be the sacrifice to which sin was to be transferred, by which sin was to be expiated and removed out of the way, that God's mercy might freely flow, 
and from the sinner's conscience, that he might have peace and joy. But as the election of the Father did not interfere with the falling of man's nature, so the redemption of the Son did not change the nature that had fallen. It was therefore necessary, that as the Father sent the Son, the Son should send the Comforter, and as it required an infinite victim to atone for man's guilt, it required an infinite agent to change man's fallen nature. As to the Father, the atonement must be made as the moral governor, as the maintainer of the rights of the eternal throne, so from the Father, through the Son, must the Holy Spirit descend to renew, to transform, to remodel, to fit human nature to gaze upon the unveiled glories of deity, and to render to God the homage due unto his name. And this just brings me to my point, effectual calling. This implies, that there is a calling that may not be effectual. Yes, there is a call that extends to the whole human family. As it is written, unto you, O men, I call and my voice is unto the sons of men. There is a call that refers to humanity as sinful, and to sinners as such, however fallen and depraved they may be. Repentance or a change of mind, repentance and remission of sins, are to be preached amongst all nations, and the disciples were to begin at Jerusalem, and, beginning at Jerusalem the slaughter, house of the Son of God, and the slaughter, house of the prophets, and of the saints, beginning there, they said, repent and he converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. But the people were like the deaf adder that stoppeth her ear, and refuseth to hear the voice of the charmer. Charm he never so wisely. The Baptist had come and cried, repent, and sternly and impressively he preached, but they paid little regard, at least, little regard that tended to life. And the Son of God, with all that was soft and winning, and captivating, came and preached, but they turned away, and he said, To whom shall I liken the men of this generation, they are like unto children sitting in the markets, and calling to their fellows, We have piped unto you, but we have not danced, and we have mourned unto you, but ye have not lamented. Now, this call must be given, because God commands it, this call must be given because God works by it. In airing the general, the universal call to all that hear the gospel, we obey the high mandate of the eternal goal, we do honor and homage to the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we employ an instrument, a weapon, if you please, by which the Spirit of God operates upon the human mind, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, and the casting down of imaginations, and every high thing, and the bringing into subjection every thought to the obedience of Christ. The general call leads to the special, to the particular, or what we designate, the effectual call. We speak to men as men, and we reason with them, we speak to sinners as sinners, and we expostulate with them, but while we reason, and while we expostulate, we have the promise of the presence of the Master, I am with you. We have the promised presence of the eternal Paraclete, who was sent to empower, sent to accompany, and sent to work by the Lord's servants, and, while we speak and give the call as we are commanded and commissioned, the Holy Spirit works, the infinite power of the eternal Spirit comes into contact, direct, immediate contact, with the mind of man. There is a power that goes with the word, distinct from the word when it is accompanied by the energy of the eternal spirit, and that power produces in the heart, life, a spiritual, a divine, an immortal life, a life that man dead in sin had not, a life which a man once having looseth not, for it is eternal, a life that was given us in Christ before the world was, a life a preserved for us by Christ all through the past ages that have rolled away a life that is communicated from the loving heart of him who is the great depository of grace, and conducted by the Holy Ghost into the heart that is called by grace, has the Spirit accompanying the word produced life? From that life springs conviction, not the cold conviction awakened occasionally in the mind of man, by the reasoning of man, by reflecting upon his past misconduct, or by the flashing of the forked lightings of the law, but a conviction that is produced by the Holy Spirit bringing the law into contact with the conscience, the gospel into contact with the heart. In the sinner's conscience God erects a tribunal, 
in the sinner's conscience God sits as judge, and to the tribunal, before the just judge, men is summoned to appear, and in the heart, in the soul, in the nature of man, there is a miniature of the judgment that is to take place at the completion and winding up of the present dispensation, the man is arraigned as a sinner, the man is convicted as a culprit, the man is condemned as a criminal, he stands before God, and he has nothing to say, every excuse has withered like the leaves of autumn, every excuse is carried away like the chaff from the summer's threshing floor, every rag that the man boasted of is torn from him, and he stands, a naked sinner, before a heart, searching God. The penetrating eye of the omniscient darts into the innermost recesses of his soul and the gentle fingers of the spirit turns over one fold of the heart after the other, the process may be long, or the operation may be quick, but sooner or later the man is brought to this, in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. He had once started at the scriptural representation of man's fallen and depraved nature, he had once wondered that from the lip of truth had proceeded the startling words, from within, out of the heart, proceed murders, adulteries, blasphemies, false witnesses, and abominable idolatries. He never could have thought that evil so dreadful, he never could have thought he cast his eye back, there are the crimes of his life, if he cast his eye forward there is the tremendous judgment, if he lift up his eyes to heaven, there is the pure and holy God that he has insulted, and if he turn his eyes within, all is dark and vain and wild, he is filled with alarm, alarm that perhaps keeps him awake by night, and haunts and harasses him by day, until he is prepared to do anything, prepared to go anywhere, if he may but escape the just judgment of his God, he is by this discipline prepared to submit to God's method of salvation, he is prepared to give up proposing conditions according to which he would be saved, he no longer goes about to work out a righteousness of his own, but he is ready to submit himself to the righteousness of God, being, therefore, conscious of his criminality, burdened with his guilt, trembling at the prospect of his destiny, he falls prostrate before the high throne of the Eternal, smites upon his breast, and cries God be merciful to me a sinner, as if no such a sinner had ever appealed to God's mercy, as if no such culprit had ever stood before God's throne, before God he says, if there can be mercy in thy heart sufficient to reach a case so dismal and so desperate, God be merciful to me, and after having pleaded with earnestness, after having supplicated with intense emotion, and after having, perhaps, become a little bold, he is startled at his own temerity, and receding, as it were from the position that he had taken, he cries, Depth of mercy, can there be mercy in thy heart for me, O God of spotless purity? And, perhaps, like David, he groans in his heart, and mourns in his soul, until his bones wax old through his roaring all the day long but, no relief, no help is found, until, at length, he begins to make confession of his sin, and, as he confesses, the Spirit of God unveils and unfolds the gospel mystery, and, as in the days of the law, when the victim was brought to the priest, and the man placed his hand upon its head, between its horns, and pressed with his might, and confessed over it all his transgressions, all his iniquities, and all his sins, so the man lays his hand of faith upon the victim's head, and the confesses his sin, as he confesses, a change takes place in his feelings, the burden begins to move from his conscience, the dark cloud that hovered over him begins to disperse a little, bright light in the cloud attracts his attention, and, as he looks upward he seems to catch the loving father's eye, and feels an encouragement within him to approach unto God, and, as he approaches, still confessing, still pleading, still deploring, still resting his hand upon the victim's head, and trusting in the atonement you have heard of, and on that alone, he seems to hear strange music, a delightful melody, and that music is the commencement of their sound of the trump of the jubilee, when the oppressed one is to go free and as he listens to the sound the chains drop from his hands, and the burden from his shoulders, the trouble is removed from his heart, and he tilts up his eyes, streaming perhaps with tears, to heaven, and says, I O Lord, I will praise thee, 
For though thou wast angry with me, thine anger is turned away, and thou comfortest me, and looking around, on those about him, in the language of wonder, astonishment and gratitude, he says, Behold, behold a mystery, behold a miracle, behold one of the greatest wonders in the universe, behold, God is my salvation, I will trust, and not be afraid, for Jah Jehovah is my strength, and my song. He also is become my salvation. He has now peace flowing into his heart like a river, he has now a consciousness that God has accepted him in the beloved, and he now experimentally knows the truth, tastes the sweetness, and feels the power of the apostolic testimony, being justified by faith we have peace with God, through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. He has now experienced the effectual call, it has been a call from darkness into marvelous light, from bondage into glorious liberty, out of prison the man comes train, from the dunghill, he is lifted up to sit among the princes, even among the princes of God's people. And, now, as I must conclude, just observe, the origin of this call is the free, the sovereign, the distinguishing grace of God. It originates, not in man's will, nor in man's disposition, nor in man's station in society, but of his will, and of his will alone, who is the great sovereign ruler of the universe, is this change effected, of man it cannot be, for it includes a new creation, a resurrection, and the inhabitation of God. Generally speaking, the instrumentality by which God works is the gospel, but in every instance the agent that produces the change is the holy and eternal spirit of God. He quickens the soul dead into trespasses and sins, he enlightens the understanding that was in the midnight darkness of nature he disposes the will which before ran counter to the will of God, he teaches the understanding that was once averse to everything pure and holy, and then gently, and lovingly, and sweetly he leads the soul to the cross to gaze upon the wondrous sufferer. He then leads the soul to the church to confess Christ and him crucified and then leads it in the paths of righteousness for his own name's sake. The calling is high, for it is from the high and holy one, it is heavenly, in contrast with the earthly calling of the descendants of Abraham of old, it is an evidence of distinguishing love, and thanks, eternal thanks to God, it is irreversible for the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance, from death to life we pass, from darkness into light we come, out of bondage into liberty we spring, from sin to the knowledge and enjoyment of holiness we are introduced, then at last from earth to heaven, into the grace of Christ, we are called, and we stand in his favor, into the fellowship of Christ, we are called and in communion with him we live, to be glorified with Christ we are called, and when Christ who is our life shall appear, we also shall appear with him in glory. The Father draws, the Spirit quickens, the Son receives, and when locked in the arms of the Son of God, our effectual calling is realized and enjoyed. Its author, is God, its subjects, are the elect, its nature, is holy, and its end, is glorious. Thus, you perceive, my friends, all originated in God's thought, which thought sprung into the perfect plan to carry out which plan provision was made, and this plan will be perfectly carried out to the praise of the glory of his grace. Thus, whether you think of election, whether you think of redemption, or whether you think of effectual calling, give all the glory to his holy name, for to him all the glory belongs, be yours the high joy still to sound forth his praise and crown him in each of your songs. The Reverend Charles Haddon Spurgeon, I think it was John Newton, who, speaking about good Calvinistic doctrine compared it to lumps of sugar, but he said, he did not so slouch give to his people the lumps of sugar, as diffuse the whole of it throughout his sermons, just as people do not eat sugar, but put it in their tea. Now, come of you have not yet grown patient enough to listen, I think, to a doctrine, however fully it may be brought out. Our people want anecdotes, illustrations parables, and metaphors, even the best and sublimest things keep our minds on such a stretch when we listen to them, that there is good need that illustrations should yield us some relief. 2. J was set apart that these doctrines might be fully brought out, this has been done, 
and there remains but one, and that my friend Mr. O'Neill is to take, namely, the final perseverance of the saints before he speaks, just one or two words. Has it never struck you that the scheme of doctrine which is called Calvinistic has much to say concerning God, it commences and ends with the Divine One? The angel of that system stands like Earl in the sun, it dwells with God, he begins, he carries on, he perfects, it is for his glory and for his honor. Father, Son, and Spirit C.O., working, the whole gospel scheme is carried out. Perhaps there may be this defect in our theology, we may perhaps too much forget man. I think that is a very small fault, compared with the fault of the opposite system, which begins with man and all but ends with him. Men is a creature, how ought God to deal with him? That is the question some theologians seem to answer. The way we put it is, God is the creator, he has a right to do as he wills, he is sovereign, there is no law above him, he has a right to make and to unmake, and when man hath sinned, he has a right to save or to destroy, if he can save, and yet not impair his justice, heaven shall ring with songs if he destroy, and yet his goodness be not marred, then hell itself with its deep base of misery, shall swell the mighty rollings of his glorious praise. We hold that God should be most prominent in all our teaching, and we hold this to be a gauge by which to test the soundness of ministers. If they exalt God and shake the sinner to the very dust, it is all well but if they lower the prerogatives of deity, if he be less sovereign, less just, or less loving than the scripture reveals him to be, and if man be puffed up with that fond notion that he is anything better than an unclean thing then such theology is utterly unsound. Salvation is of the Lord, and let the Lord alone be glorified. The final perseverance of believers in Christ Jesus. A sermon by the Reverend William O'Neill Minister of New Broad Street Chapel. London. My dear brethren and friends, most unexpectedly did the kind invitation of my esteemed brother, Mr. Spurgeon, come to me, to take part in the present service of this beautiful house. And after I had engaged to come I sincerely wished that I had not. I felt, however, that it would not be proper to retire from the engagement, but seek to meet it in a becoming spirit, both towards God's truth and God's people. I will now try to do this. I utter here, of course, my own sentiments, as I am not responsible for anything that has been or may be said by another speaker, so I alone am responsible for what I shall say. But though I am not the delegate or representative of any church, denomination, or community, I doubt not that my declaration of faith on the matter in hand will be, in all substantial points, that of a very large number who love Jesus and are living in his service, that I desire to believe what the Bible teaches, and that I am sincere in my convictions, I know to be true, but that there are thousands of excellent Christians on the other side admits of no doubt, and should not be questioned by any one of their deep sincerity, love to God and his gospel, zeal and devotedness in holy things, self-denying labors in the divine service and the cultivation and manifestation of Christian graces, I would and do speak with the most earnest approval I give them as much credit for sincerity as I claim for myself, and I do this not as a favor, but as a piece of simple justice. Yet we differ, differ as to what the sacred oracles teach on the doctrine now before us, and it is competent and right for all men to examine, each one for himself, which of our opinions is that which is taught in the Bible for certainly both are not taught there. The question, is it possible for sincere Christians, truly regenerated persons, to be finally separated from Jesus, to lose the favor of God their Father, and be eternally shut out from his smile and home, is one of no small moment. It involves issues of the most momentous nature, and cannot but be unspeakably interesting to every believer in Christ. We say, with unfaltering tongue, that of all the dead, everyone who was ever renewed in heart is now in heaven, and that reconciliation with God on earth, through Christ Jesus, will, in every case, end in the everlasting salvation of the soul. Did God, then, tell us that all who are here now are his regenerated people, or that they were, we should believe that when the role of the finally saved shall be called, every one of them would answer to that call by saying, Here am I. 
Lord, thy right arm, and the effectual operation of thy spirit and grace has done it all, and now am I to be forever happy, forever sinless, forever safe. It is hardly necessary to say, that we believe this view of the case to be in entire harmony with the teaching of God's book to the law and to the testimony, if we, or others, speak not on this and on all other matters according to that word, it is because there is no light in us or in them. Isaiah 8, 20, having called public attention to this doctrine lately in a small book, Unchanging Love. Tresida, Ave Maria Lane. London. All the texts that are usually quoted in opposition to the doctrine now noticed are passed under calm review. In which I have sought to obey the Master's command. Search the scriptures, I will now, with your kind permission, direct attention to a few portions of the divine word that, we believe, fully establish the doctrine of the saints' final preservation and perseverance. On each of those texts my words must be few as the time allotted to me is short. Hear then the Holy Spirit's teaching when speaking by the prophet Samuel, for the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it hath pleased the Lord to make you his people. 1 Samuel 12, 22, this, we think, is conclusive. What Christian does not know, and knowing, does not mourn over, the untrustworthiness of his own heart, and feeling fully assured that it is impossible for him to vanquish the world, the flesh, and the devil, how welcome to his heart is the declaration, the Lord will not forsake his people. No, he thought proper to renew their hearts, to quicken them into spiritual life, and he will mercifully continue to carry on his good work in their souls till it shall be perfected in glory. The reason why he will not forsake his people is stated here, most explicitly, just as much so as is the declaration of his unchangeable love. It is not that they were less sinful by nature or practice than others, or because of any moral qualities that were found in them, but because it pleased the Lord to make them his people. Here another portion, God, speaking by his prophet Isaiah, says, Can a woman forget her sucking child? that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb. Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Isaiah 49, 15, 16, this we regard as a most interesting as well as a most consolatory portion of scripture. Zion said, The Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. This was not only an error in creed, it was also a dishonorable estimate of the divine character, and to it the gracious one replies in these words, Can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet will not I forget thee. The affection of a right-minded mother for her tender and helpless offspring is one of the strongest that is experienced by human beings. But, though strong, very strong, it may, alas give way. It is, at best, only a creature's love, and therefore changeable, while that love which is exercised by God towards his believing children is, like himself, unchangeable. These words prove, and were designed to prove, most conclusively, that the love of the Divine Father towards his adopted sons and daughters is not a fluctuating or changing thing. What other, or what lower interpretation can we put upon the words, yet will not I forget thee, and not forgetting them is, in this case, equivalent to his continuing to care for, to keep, and tenderly regard them. Hear God again speaking by the same prophet, for a small moment have I forsaken thee but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. For this is as the waters of Noah unto me, for as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be wroth with thee, nor rebuke thee. For the mountains shall depart, and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord that hath mercy on thee. These words deserve to hold a prominent place among those which God has spoken for the comfort and joy of his people. Their obvious design is to sustain believers under the chastening hand of God, and to do this by considerations drawn from his own character, and not from anything in themselves. Vain, brethren, 
is it to trust, or put confidence in our own false hearts? They are weak as helpless infancy. To lean on them will only be evidence of our folly and of our sin. We are not to find consolation in our gifts, in our graces, in our labors, in our resolutions, or in our experience, nor by the grace of God will we do so but when chastised by the ever, loving and good Father, when smarting under his parental and deserved stripes, we may feast our souls on his blessed words, words that fire those souls with confidence, hope, and love. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee. For the mountains shall depart, and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee, neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord that hath mercy on thee. Such, brethren, are God's utterances. These are the words of one who is unchangeable in affection, of one who says, Oh! Blessed be his adorable name for that saying, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Malachi 3, 6. I name another passage, for this shall arise, says Jesus, false Christ, and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch, that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Matthew 24, 24, the plain and obvious meaning of this latter clause is, that it is not possible to deceive or earlier to their final ruin, the adopted sons and daughters of God, those whom he has chosen to be his, nothing less, we believe, was intended by the gracious speaker, and we see not how any other meaning can be consistently given to the language which he here uses. The words, if it were possible, only say, in another form, it is not possible. I now name such texts as connect faith, or believing in Christ, with salvation of which the following are a few. God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son, and believeth on him, may have everlasting life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am the living bread which came down from heaven, if any man eat of this bread he shall live forever. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. John 3, 16, 5, 24, 6, 47, 50, 51, 57, Romans 1, 16, the plain teaching of these, and many similar passages, is, that every believer in Jesus hath everlasting life. They teach this or they teach nothing. If this be not their meaning, what is? But, can that which is everlasting cease to be? Can it come to an end? No words can more plainly assert than these do, that whosoever believeth in Jesus shall not come into condemnation that all believers in him shall enjoy everlasting life. We take these gracious assurances as proving, to the fullest extent, the doctrine for which we plead. If the belief of the gospel be not followed, in every instance, by eternal blessedness, what did Paul mean when he said, The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth? Romans 1, 16, If, at the last day, a single one be unsaved of those who had believed the gospel, who had been united to Christ by faith in his name, the apostle's words must needs be falsified, his teaching is not true. This, at least, is our opinion. No amount of adverse criticism can set aside the evidence that such verses as these furnish in support of the blessed doctrine which we now defend. Hear Christ again, my sheep, he says, hear my voice, and I know them and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any one pluck them out of my hand. My Father who gave them me is greater than all, and no one is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. We regard this entire passage as one of the most delightful and consoling in the scriptures. It teaches most unequivocally, in the plainest, strongest, and most conclusive terms, that Christ's believing ones shall never perish, 
that no enemy, human or hellish, shall be able to wrench them out of his or his father's covenanted and secure grasp. Infinite power, no less than infinite love, both existing in their God and Saviour, stand guarantee for their security. Neither men nor demons shall be able to defeat or overturn the purpose of divine grace concerning them. Difficulties, many and sharp, may surround them, and temptations, fierce and fiery, may assault their souls. But divine love, wisdom, grace, and power shall be ever on their side. Jesus, the faithful and true witness, says, they shake never perish. Elsewhere he says, because I live, ye shall live also. John 14, 17, the spiritual life of believers is in his keeping, and he here declares that it is as secure as his own. If he dies, and continues not to be their advocate with the Father, 1 John 2, 1, their intercessor at the right hand of God, Romans 8, 34, then may they die also, but not otherwise. In perfect keeping with his Lord's words are those which Paul uses, when referring to the same subject. For if, he says, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Romans 5, 10, that is, we shall be preserved in that state of reconciliation by Christ's intercessory life at God's right hand in heaven. He, the God, man, lives there as mediator, for them, he holds and exercises all power in heaven and on earth for the welfare and safety of his church, and they cannot die while he lives. The power that is to destroy the spiritual life of the weakest saint must first destroy the life of that saint's head. Their life as the Holy Spirit by Paul elsewhere teaches, is hid with Christ in God. Colossians 3, 3. Where, brethren, could it be safer? or as safe, in whose care or keeping could it be so secure? It is hid with Christ in God. Not only so, but the Apostle goes on to say, When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. This, to say the least of it, is a glorious statement and declaration. Can language, we ask, go beyond that which is used in these texts to guarantee the eternal salvation of every believer in Jesus? The head and members shall never be separated. They are bound up in an inseparable and an unchanging union. Here a divine lesson given in another place, moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Romans 8, 30. When it is said, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, we must interpret the word called to mean very much more than invited, for the apostle goes no to say, whom he called, them he also justified. We know that this is only true of those who believe in Jesus, who are effectually called or drawn, by the combined operations of the word and spirit of God, into the blessed fellowship and joys of the gospel, 1 Corinthians 1, 9, that those, and only those, who believe in Christ are justified, is the uniform lesson of the divine word, John 3, 16, 36, Acts 13, 39, 40, Romans 1, 16, 3, 22, 28. Let it be noted that Paul affirms three things here. The first is, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. The second is, whom he called, them he also justified. And the third is, whom he justified, them he also glorified. What, then, does he mean by the expression glorified? Does he, or can he mean anything less than the enjoyment of everlasting life? We say, then, that were only a single individual out of the whole number of those who have been, or shall be justified by faith in Jesus, to come short of heaven the declaration would not be true that whom he justified, them he also glorified. Here another divine proclamation relative to the security of God's people, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8, 38, 39. These brethren, 
are notes of the most triumphant character, relative to the ultimate blessedness of believers in Jesus. The terms which are here used are such as leave no doubt as to what the Holy Spirit, speaking by Paul, meant to teach. We deliberately affirm that language has no power to assert the doctrine for which we contend more conclusively than is here done. Words have no meaning, nor are they of any use in communicating thought, if these words were not used by a man who believed as we do on the matter in the hand. And we are entirely willing to believe or disbelieve with the Apostle Paul, neither more nor less. I quote him again. Hear what he wrote to the church at Philippi, being confident of this very thing, that I who hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. I well remember how greatly this passage strengthened my own soul when, in the morning of my religious life, I was passing through much mental conflict. And are not these words well calculated to comfort the hearts of those who, through grace, have believed in the Saviour? Is there any room for objecting criticism here, or is there any ambiguity in the language employed? No, there is none whatever, the Apostle was confident of this very thing. What very thing? Why, that wherever the Divine Spirit had commenced this good work of grace in the soul, he would complete it. No other power could have begun it, and no other power is competent to carry it forward to completion. That he who commences that good work is able to finish it, no professing Christian will deny, that he will finish it, this verse most clearly teaches. The Apostle Paul was confident of this very thing, and so are we. Let us give attention to other words of the same sacred penman. Addressing one of the primitive churches he says, we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth, 2 Thessalonians 2, 13. This is a most important portion of scripture in relation to the question, what is the end of election? In what does it, or is it to terminate? What does it secure? Are its subjects merely chosen to enjoy the light of the gospel? the means of grace, and no more? Or, are they chosen to enjoy, in its full measure, everlasting life, the priceless favor and blissful fellowship of God here and forever? This question is definitely settled by the language of inspiration employed here. The apostle declares that the choice is to salvation, or, in other words, which he also uses in this place, to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. This means, of course, eternal life in heaven, as well as all that proceeds and prepares for it on earth. But how can this be realized? How can it be said? They were chosen to salvation, if they may all apostatize finally from Jesus, fall out of the divine favor, and be forever numbered with the lost. The thing is, of course, impossible. If not saved, fully and forever, it would not be true to say they were chosen to salvation. I beg to name one passage more. Speaking of believers, a divinely inspired teacher says, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, 1 Peter 1, 5. Here we are distinctly taught what the divine being is doing and will continue to do for his believing people. The apostle asserts, that they are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. If so, nothing is more certain than that they shall reach it and enjoy it forever. Had Peter believed that it was possible for any number of them to become outcasts from God, and die in their sins, he would never have employed the language which is found here, the declaration that believers are kept or garrisoned in, for such is the meaning of the term here employed, by the power of God through faith unto salvation, settles the point with us and leaves us nothing more to desire in the shape of statement or promise. This is, indeed, a glorious declaration. Fellow pilgrims, let it fill you with the highest joy, as it gives you the fullest assurance that you are safe in the grasp and guardianship of Jehovah of hosts. We hold and teach too, that the certain enjoyment of everlasting life, inseparably connected with continued faith in the divine testimony concerning sin, Jesus, and his salvation. They shall be preserved in the exercise of faith in the Redeemer, until they shall enter upon the possession of the heavenly inheritance. This is clearly taught here, and nothing less. I have now referred to a few out of the many portions of God's word which teach the doctrine for which we contend. God's people shall be preserved, 
and will persevere to the end, for they were given to Christ in the everlasting covenant, that covenant which is ordered in all things and sure, the stability of which is as safe as the oath, and promise, and power of God can make it, Psalm 89. 30, 34, Hebrews 6, 18, 19, they are loved by him with an everlasting love, Jeremiah 31, 3, they are chosen to salvation, Ephesians 1, 4, 2 Thessalonians 2, 13, and God, their gracious and reconciled Father, will rest in his love, Zephaniah 3, 17, their safety, as believers in Jesus, is secured by the word and promise of the God that cannot lie. He has said that he will never leave them nor forsake them, Hebrews 13, 2, that they shall never perish, John 10, 28, and that he will confirm them unto the end, 1 Corinthians 1, 8. For this purpose, the ever-availing intercession of Jesus is employed. He is at the right hand of God as their brother, representative, and advocate. If he prays for them that their faith fail not, Luke 22, 32, they are, each and all, born on his heart and pleaded for in his gracious and ever, successful intercession. Father, says he, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, John 17, 24. Oh, what priceless joy do these words afford to the believer's heart. No weapon that is formed against them shall prosper. Their almighty king will vanquish all their spiritual foes. He will so aid them that they shall contend victoriously against the world, the flesh, and the devil. They shall be more than conquerors through him that loved them. Romans 8, 37. They shall be the saved of his right arm, and the everlasting monuments and trophies of his grace, love, and power. They are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise which is the earnest of their inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession. 2 Corinthians 1, 21, 22, Ephesians 1, 13, 14. Having received the earnest, the pledge which guarantees the fulfillment of their heavenly Father's covenant to save them, they are perfectly and forever secure. We build our faith in this doctrine on God's plain teaching. We extort no meaning from his word which cannot be found there by the simple and ordinary reader of it. We take its statements in their plain grammatical sense, just as they would be interpreted by any unprejudiced expounder of language. We should be content to abide by the interpretation of them which would be given by any man infidel or other, who felt no interest in our controversy, and who was entirely careless relative to our differences of opinion. One unequivocal passage teaching this doctrine would be, or should be sufficient to establish it, and to bring out opinions into harmony with divine teaching, but we are not confined to one, or five, or ten, we have line upon line, promise upon promise, assurance upon assurance and declaration upon declaration to this effect, so that we would fain ask, if the doctrine be not taught in the portions of scripture that I have named, what is taught in them? What is their import? What do they teach? Or, what language or terms would be thought sufficient to teach it? It is our firm conviction that no doctrine of religion is more clearly taught in the Bible than is this. It is expressed as plainly as words can possibly do it. And are we, with these inspired declarations before us, to suppose it possible for wicked men or demons to say, when pointing to numbers of the lost, the Most High began to build up his kingdom in their souls, but he was not able to finish it, he quickened them into spiritual life, renewed, pardoned, justified, and sanctified them, but now they are torn from his grasp. His enemies were able, contrary to the words, of Jesus, 1 John 10, 21, to pluck them out of his hand, and they have done it. This would, indeed, make short work of many plain and positive declarations found in the Bible, it would prove, beyond doubt, that its promises, and assurances, and declarations are of very little value. Let me, before I close, say, and say with the fullest emphasis possible, that we believe as firmly as any man living, as firmly as we believe and a truth taught in the Bible, that without holiness no man shall see the Lord. Hebrews 12, 14 We know no other evidence of being in Christ, or of being a Christian, 
than that which is furnished by a life and behavior becoming the gospel. And though holiness is not the cause of God's first or continued love to his people, it is the effect and fruit of that love, and a main part of the salvation which is in Christ Jesus, that salvation to which they are chosen, Ephesians 1, 4, and he who is satisfying himself with the notion that he is safe for eternity, while he is living in any known sin, is turning the grace of our God into licentiousness, and is a deadly enemy of the cross of Christ. The blessed doctrine which the Bible teaches, and in which we glory, is, the doctrine of the saints' final perseverance, and that doctrine was never designed to comfort any man who is not living a life of faith in the Son of God, intensely anxious to please God in all things and to be the holy and happy subject of that mind which was in Jesus. Very interesting, then, is the question, when asked in no wrong spirit, are the few that be saved? If God does not hold up his people, if he does not keep them by his grace and power, they will be very few indeed, a child may count them, and, in fact, have none, not one to count. But let no man charge our views with being narrow or embracing only a few or contemplating the eternal salvation of a very limited number of our race, for, according to the view which we hold and teach, they will be a numberless number, we believe, and our hearts swell with high and holy joy in believing, that every child of man who loved God, every one of Adam's race who was renewed in heart, all who were ever on the Lord's side, will be found among the saved. Not one will be lost. Not one will be missed from the eternal banquet. Not one will be outside the gates of the holy city. All, all shall be there, and there forever, and ever, and ever. The soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose, he will not, he cannot, give up to his foes, that soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, he'll never, no, never, no, never forsake, oh, never. 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 No.